Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday to you all. I hope you are all feeling well this morning. I just uh, wanted to say thank you for uh, joining us for day daily devotions through Redeeming Life Fellowship. If we haven't met before, my name is Dan. I'm a teaching pastor here, and I'm just delighted that we have this time together as we continue to learn and read and grow as we read the Bible and uh, come to see God for who he is and um, and grow in our relationship with him, our living relationship with the living God. Today, as we follow the Revived School reading plan that's been leading us through the major prophets and uh, leading us into the book of Daniel, a marvelously fascinating book. And uh, we're going to be focusing, the reading plan will focus on uh, Daniel chapters 5 and 6, which tell uh, two fairly well-known stories. And uh, one of them, chapter 6, you'll probably remember as Daniel in the lion's den, uh, one of the most uh, famous and well-known narratives of the entire book, or in the entire Bible, really. But today, uh, our devotional is going to focus primarily on chapter 5, a lesser-known narrative between the two. And uh, from this chapter is actually is where we get one of our one of the best known uh, f English figures of speech that are borrowed from the Bible. There's actually uh, more than certainly a handful of them. Uh, when you uh, hear somebody lament about a bad day or where everything has just gone wrong or or um, dealing with uh, a continuous problem that gives them stress and anxiety, they'll often say that, well, this is just my cross to bear. That's a figure of speech borrowed from the Bible. Or uh, if in sports, if you talk about a two competition between two rivals and uh, somebody describes it as this is being a, uh, a real David versus Goliath, that's another thing that's borrowed from the Bible. And perhaps you've heard the figure of speech called, or saying something like this, uh, you can see the hand writing on the wall. In other words, when something has happened or somebody issues a certain decree or moves in a particular direction, uh, when you see that happening, you know that it's a sign of something else that is bound to happen, that's going to happen, that is not bode well for you or for somebody else. You can see the handwriting on the wall. Judgment has come down. This is over. Uh, when you hear somebody say, I can see the handwriting on the wall, uh, the, the judgment that's implied by a certain act or, or sign, that comes from this chapter we're about to read, Daniel chapter 5. As many, uh, many uh, English translations and its heading over the chapter is just called that, the handwriting on the wall. And what I would want for us today is to uh, try and uh, get at the pulse or the heartbeat of what's going on in this narrative and why it's so important uh, for all of us today. And... Uh, I want to try and explain that with uh, an object lesson uh, today. This mug uh, I've had for several years, and it actually means uh, uh, a lot to me. Um, this, I'll actually uh, point it to you. Um, you'll see as I rotate this, I hope it's close enough for you, uh, a mug that has a picture of my family uh, uh, that we've had for a very long time. And maybe you can see me there. I look so much younger then, don't I? Uh, but yeah, this uh, this mug, I guess I've, it's been worn. It's got a few chips in it. But it means a lot to me. Well, for one, uh, because uh, it was made as a special gift. And it uh, contains a lot of whatever beverage you have in it, which is all the better, too. But also... Whenever I drink out of this mug, uh, I'm reminded of the special relationship I have with my brothers, my sister-in-law, 
my sisters-in-law, excuse me, uh, my nieces, my nephews, uh, my friends who have been coming and, and really just who are on the outside and have really become a part of my family, like a certain Sarah Freestone there. Uh, and uh, not least of all, a uh, remember, reminder of the relationship with my wife, uh, so that whenever I'm drinking out of this mug, uh, I'm reminded of something that is certainly very sacred to me, something that's uh, central to my, my life, and that's my relationship with my family. So this, uh, this mug, yeah, is, is, uh, it's very special. And uh, I can't just go out and get another one uh, since I've had it for a long time. It bears certain marks and chips and memories of, of, of certain knocks that this has had while it's been washed. Uh, I like this mug a lot. Uh, it is very, very important to me. Let's suppose uh, someone uh, just came in and uh, broke into our house and took all of our mugs. If you've been over at our house, you know that we have a lot of mugs. And some of them, you know, more or less important than the others, but suddenly took all my mugs. And supposing someday I uh, found at somebody's house or at a party down the road, uh, I came to find that this mug uh, somebody who somebody had stolen was being used like a solo cup. And they were, let's say, playing beer pong with it. That would trouble me, not just simply because something that was precious to me was stolen, but that there was something that was so valuable and not just valuable because it's a nice mug, but it's valuable because it represents something more. Namely, this precious, sacred relationship that I have with my family. If this sort of thing was being used by some careless neighbor uh, who was using it to play beer pong in it, I would be upset. I would be rightfully upset because you've taken something that was sacred, something that was irreplaceable, and you were treating it like something that that was nothing. You, you, you took something that was sacred, that was of ultimate value, of sacred value, and you made it as something that was no value, that, that didn't mean anything to you, that once the party was over, the thing would be discarded like all red solo cups are. Nobody wants to, to, to keep a red solo cup. Uh, unless you're my mom who washes them and reuses them, which, granted, that's a good thing. But in the long run, she has no sacred attachment to it. And uh, that comparison is something that's helpful to be able to understand the narrative of chapter, uh, chapter 5, which uh, begins uh, by Belshazzar, uh, who is the, the king of Babylon at the time, this reigning uh, empire over the known world, who's throwing a party for all of his, all of his, uh, his nobles and his special guests, and he brings in the, the goblets and the plateware that had been ransacked, that had been plundered when Babylon had overthrown Jerusalem and taken all the sacred vessels and the accouterments that were filled in this temple that were designed, uh, that were sacred for fellowship with the living God when people come to meet with him in his, in his temple. And, uh, and by bringing in all of these sacred vessels and throwing a party with them, it's like he's taking something that was sacred, that actually meant something, that signified something that was not only valuable, but of, of ultimate value, and treating it like a, a solo cup, uh, as nothing more than just something to use when you're par out partying with your friends. Because the important thing to remember about these sacred vessels that, 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 uh, Belshazzar brings in, 
is that these sacred vessels were not just sacred because they belong to a temple, but they're sacred for what they signify, namely living fellowship that the Israelites would have with the living God who would dwell in their midst. To see that this, this the, the, the temple in Jerusalem was filled with things like pots and pans and cups and stoneware is to signify something that's much greater than just the temple, but that there's God's desire to want to have fellowship with his people, as it were, around a table. Uh, that to, to, to have these types of, you know, goblets and plates, forks, knives, etc., uh, symbolizes something that's even greater than the goblets themselves, namely that God's relationship with us is something that's to be treated as something is that is uh, um, sacred and holy and necessary and irreplaceable. If all of those things are true, if that's what uh, uh, a cup in the temple, in the temple of the living God signifies, then yes, that cup is of, of sacred value, of ultimate value, not because the cup is so great, but because it symbolizes something that's so much greater. That is our fellowship with, with, uh, with the living God. That is, is something that, that, that when Belshazzar uh, comes and takes something that is so sacred and so holy and something that is of, of ultimate value and treats it like a solo cup, this is when he sees the hand writing on the wall. And out of nowhere, there is a hand that appears and starts writing on this wall for everybody to see at this party. And uh, Belshazzar is terrified uh, and is deathly pale and his knees are knocking because he doesn't know what's, go what's, what's happening. And he calls in all of his enchanters and his wise men and says, somebody, please read and interpret this. And nobody can do it. And then uh, it is the queen who says, you know, there is a person named Daniel who is wise about interpreting visions and dreams. And he served your forefathers uh, in, in helping them through their dreams. Like, he's the person to come and do this. So Daniel is summoned and he says, yes, I can read and interpret what's, what's happening. And uh, Daniel says, I know that... Uh, the, the, the prize or the reward that you want to bestow on the person who can read and interpret this, it's nothing to me. You can keep your gold chain and your, um, and your royal robes. Uh, I don't care that you want to make me the third highest in the uh, command in the, all the, the, the provinces of Babylon. That really doesn't mean anything to me but he still comes and interprets it anyway. And so let's read together and make a few observations. And this is be chapter five, beginning in verse 18. And it says this, O king, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the peoples and nations and men of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar saw himself not only as sovereign over the nations, but ultimately sovereign, that there is nothing that he could not do because he was indeed Lord over all. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. Uh, does it ever come to our senses that pride has a way of hardening our hearts? In other words, when our hearts are swollen with pride, it has a way of 
hardening them to the point where um, they're no longer sensitive or they can feel or that that they can actually be humbled and that God lowers the proud uh, in order to be able to soften their hearts and have a heart that's responsive to him. And that that's what God did to Nebuchadnezzar. And so if there's at least one point to remember is that we should be cautious about how in which we take our accomplishments and we take pride in our accomplishments and we make them our own and that that has a way indeed uh, to to harden our hearts so that we're no longer uh, responsive to God's grace and God's love and we in effect become our own gods and um, keep God out of the picture where our hearts are not conditioned, enlivened, and, and even humbled, uh, rightly humbled before God uh, when our hearts are soft before him. So let that be your prayer. God, give me a soft heart that's responsive to you. And it says this, he was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them any one he wishes. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Belshazzar has no excuse for not knowing. He knew all of this was to be the case. And yet, and yet, he still thought himself the center of the universe, sovereign over the nations, and that he can take things of ultimate value and treat them as if that they were of no value. Taking something that is precious, sacred, and holy and treating it like a solo cup. That's what pride does to us, that we no longer have the capacity to be able to, dis to discern what it is that is of ultimate value, that is truly sacred, namely our relationship with God and recognizing him as holy and sovereign over our lives and treating it as if it's of no value, um, where you have no regard in your heart or in your lives or in your decisions, your thoughts, your attitudes, you have no regard over, uh, of God in your life. There is no fear of God before your eyes. That was Belshazzar. Even though he knew all of this, he said, I will have it my way. And it says this, Instead, you have set up yourself against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank from them. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see, hear, or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. If it is true that God does hold your life in all your ways in the palm of his hand, if that is true, there is nothing more important than your relationship with God and walking humbly before him. There's nothing in this world that's more important than that. Nebuchadnezzar realized it, but his, his descendants did not. And they're paying the price for it. And it says this, Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. This is what the words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. In other words, Belshazzar if you yourself have taken what is of ultimate value and treated it as if it is no value, I'm going to take your life that you have, and your all of your pride of your accomplishments that you've made, 
as of ultimate value, I'm going to treat your life like a disposable solo cup that is of no value. Belshazzar, this is how I'm going to regard your life. You have been weighed in the scales and been found wanting. It's the glories and the majesty and the pride that you've had in, in, in being at the top of the world. It means nothing to me. But yes, and then it says, Peres, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel says, um, you know, I have no need for, you know, the gifts that you want to give, even though he gives it anyway. The irony behind it is that the honor that's bestowed upon Daniel to be third highest ruler in the kingdom doesn't mean that much because this kingdom, this Babylonian empire, at this stage in the narrative is probably not going to last much longer than a couple of hours. So it's like being elevated to, you know, the uh, chief operating officer of a company that is about to go bankrupt. Uh, like, yay, good job for you. Um, the, the title and the glories that are attached to it mean nothing. And they would have meant nothing anyway to, to Daniel because he knows that God is indeed sovereign and that his pride of his accomplishments is not in the purple cloth or the gold necklace. Uh, because he knows that God is sovereign and that there's there's no pride of accomplishments that 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 is equivalent or that it all pales in comparison to the glory of walking in relationship with the living God that he would continue as we would see in right here in chapter six and then it says this that very night Belshazzar king of the Babylonians was slain and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at age 62. With Belshazzar, the pride of his heart led to his downfall, and perhaps it could have been different. Indeed, it should have been different. And I do believe that none of us is above falling in the same way that Belshazzar did. We harden our hearts before God. Our pride hardens our hearts before God to the point where... Um, we regard our relationship with him and recognizing him as sovereign that that becomes not only secondary in our lives, but actually of, of no importance. And that can only, only lead to death and destruction. We want to be more like Daniel in this, in this scenario where uh, our hearts are not attached to wanting to be the most important person, even though God endowed uh, Daniel with uh, glory and honor and indeed uh, unmatched wisdom and power among all of his peers, that um, none of that went to his head because uh, he could recognize that God is indeed sovereign and that God is holy and that there's nothing more important to him than abiding in faithful relationship with, with, with the living God. So, I pray today, let God search your heart. Uh, let God search all of our hearts so that we don't become so self-preoccupied like Belshazzar um, that we cannot read the handwriting on the wall, but that we will recognize just how valuable our relationship with God actually is, and to make that our foremost and utmost priority in the way that we live our lives. So, uh, thank you so much for taking time to enjoy, uh, I hope you enjoyed, uh, the daily devotions today. Uh, if you haven't, do please subscribe to the YouTube channel so that uh, you get daily notifications to follow along with our, with our reading plan, and uh, I'm excited for the time that we'll all be able to meet together uh, uh, and learn and grow as the people of God and see what God uh, wants to do uh, in and among the people of Whitley County. So God bless you. Take care and I'll see you next time.